On this episode of Black Girl Gone, I tell the story of Valerie, Shantia, and Duena Pride, who were stabbed to death inside their Phoenix, Arizona home on September 6, 1982. Valerie, who was 24 years old, was home that night with her daughters, Shantia, who was eight, and Duena, who was four, when someone came and knocked on their door. When Valerie's boyfriend came home, he found all three dead inside the house. They had all been stabbed multiple times. The investigation into these brutal murders left detectives scrambling for suspects and a motive. Over 40 years later, two questions remain. Who killed Valerie and her girls, and why? This is Valerie, Shantia, and Duena's story. When some people hear about an unsolved murder that took place over 40 years ago, it's hard for them to imagine that after all this time, there is a possibility that it can be solved. But with the advancement of technology and renewed attention, we have seen time and time again cold cases be solved. The stabbing death of two young girls and their mother is a case that continues, even after decades, to be one that needs the public's attention. Someone knows something, and the family of these victims deserves to find out the truth. Valerie Latham was born on March 9th, 1958, and was raised in Arizona alongside her five brothers and one sister. She attended South Mountain High School, and after graduation, she went on to attend Arizona State University. In high school, Valerie started dating a young man named Jimmy Pride, and eventually they got married. In 1974, Valerie gave birth to her first daughter, Shantia, and then three years later, she had her second daughter, Duena, in 1977. Outside of her role as a mother and wife, Valerie, according to those who knew her, was a very accomplished young woman. She had aspirations of becoming an electrician, and around the same time her second daughter was born, she had begun an apprenticeship co-sponsored by the Electric Workers Union. Valerie began working as an electrician in the program at Palo Verde Nuclear Plant. Not only was this a major accomplishment personally for Valerie, it was also history-making at the company because she was the first Black female electrician to ever work there. Even at such a young age and with two young children of her own, Valerie had achieved so much. At the time, she and her young family were living in Phoenix, Arizona, but there isn't any public information about Valerie's husband. However, after being married for a few years, eventually the couple, who had been high school sweethearts, ended their marriage. Valerie's apprenticeship at the power plant was a four-year apprenticeship, and so even though divorces can be hard, she was focused on achieving her goals. After her divorce, she began dating a man named Ben, who also worked at the plant with her. Ben also had children from a previous relationship. Valerie and Ben's relationship became serious, and the couple began planning a life together. There were, however, issues in the relationship, according to Valerie's sister, Vicky. She told ABC 15 in Phoenix during an interview that there were issues in Ben's past that affected his relationship with Valerie. Now, she did not specify what those issues were, but she said that Ben would always reassure Valerie that he was handling whatever it was. Now, the issues that the couple may have had did not stop Valerie from continuing her relationship with Ben, and eventually, the couple decided to purchase a home together, which was a very big step. In 1982, they settled on a Spanish-style home that had just been built in the South Mountain area of Phoenix. As Valerie began the final year of her apprenticeship, her life was headed in the right direction. She was on her way to being a successful electrician and, even after her divorce, had found love again and bought a new home. There was no way for Valerie or anyone that knew her 
to foresee what would happen to her and her daughters just a few weeks after they moved into their new home. Labor Day weekend 1982 had started normally for Valerie and her daughters. But on Monday, September 6, 1982, what started as a normal holiday became anything but. Around 4 p.m., Ben got a devastating phone call. His daughter, who was nine years old at the time, had an epileptic seizure while taking a bath and had been rushed to the hospital. According to reports, the little girl had been in the tub and her mother had been supervising her, but when she stepped away for a brief moment, the seizure occurred and the nine-year-old had slipped under the water. Doctors at the hospital attempted to save the little girl's life, but by the time Ben arrived at the hospital, his daughter had been pronounced dead. While Ben was at the hospital dealing with this tragedy of his daughter's sudden death, Valerie and the girls were home alone. In a time before cell phones, there would have been no way for Valerie to contact Ben to get updates about what was going on, and so she would have just had to wait for him to contact her. What exactly was going on in the hours after Ben left for the hospital is not exactly known, but what we do know is that around 9.30 p.m., Valerie spoke to Ben's brother on the phone. Now, over the years, reporting about who was on the phone has varied. Some reports state Valerie was on the phone with a friend, while others say it was her brother. But in a recent interview, Vicky, Valerie's sister, said that she was on the phone with Ben's brother. Now, according to Ben's brother, he and Valerie spoke on the phone for about 10 minutes or so. And so if she was speaking to Ben's brother, he may have been giving her an update about what was going on with Ben's daughter. But nonetheless, he said during their conversation, someone knocked on the door of Valerie's home. She said she had to get off the phone to answer the door since Ben wasn't home, and they ended their conversation. Now, little did he know that he would be the last person to ever speak to Valerie. At around 10 p.m. that night, after hours at the hospital, Ben returned home with no idea what awaited him on the other side of his front door. When he first walked up to his home, he immediately noticed that the front door was open. And that was unusual to him because it was the summer in Arizona, and so people don't leave their doors open. But... When Ben pushed the door open and stepped in the living room of his home, he found a brutal and bloody crime scene. Valerie's two daughters, eight-year-old Shantia and four-year-old Duena, were lying in the living room covered in blood. Both children were dead. In the dining room area, a few feet away near the kitchen, he found Valerie. She was also dead and covered in blood. What Ben found in his home was indescribable, and he began screaming hysterically after finding Valerie and her daughters. His cries were so loud that neighbors came out of their homes to see what was going on, and they ended up calling the police for Ben, who was inconsolable. It's hard to imagine what was going on in his mind. He had just found out his own daughter had died, and then he came home to find his girlfriend and her daughters slaughtered in the home that they had just moved into. When police arrived at the scene, for some of the officers, it was the worst crime scene that they had ever encountered. There was blood all over the home. Quote, my God, it's terrible in there. There are stabbings everywhere, one of the detectives told the Arizona Republic newspaper. Murders involving stabbings can be some of the most gruesome, but when there are also children involved, it makes the crime scene even that much more difficult to deal with. In the living room, the detectives who arrived at the scene found the two girls huddled together in the living room near the love seat. They were in their pajamas and had likely been getting ready for bed when they were attacked. Valerie was found in the dining area near the kitchen. Her body was found feet from the back door. All three victims had been stabbed multiple times. Reports state that one of the girls had been mutilated. There had been no forced entry at the home, and so before receiving information about the knock on the door, police weren't sure how the killer gained entry to the house. 
But they had been able to determine that they had escaped out the back door and jumped over the fence to get away. Now, the initial assumption that this may have been a robbery gone wrong was quickly ruled out. As police began to try and process the crime scene, news of what happened inside the home began to spread throughout the neighborhood where they lived. And finding who did this and why was the cops' top priority. With no forced entry and no robbery, it was clear that the Pride family had been targeted and the stabbing, and it was personal. But who would want to kill a mother and her two little girls? Investigators had no idea, but they did know one thing. They needed to find whoever it was, and they needed to find them fast. On September 6th, 1982, Valerie Shantia and Duena Pride were found stabbed to death inside their Phoenix, Arizona home. After they were found, detectives began to try and piece together a motive and a suspect. As investigators continued to process the crime scene at the house where Valerie and her children had been brutally murdered, they noticed that the condition of the home meant that it was likely that someone had heard something. Police and detectives began canvassing the neighborhood, speaking to neighbors of Valerie's and Ben's to see if they had heard anything unusual. One of the neighbors they spoke to said that they did hear some kind of commotion at the house at around 9.45 p.m. They said that they heard what sounded like an argument coming from the home. Now, the neighbors said that they thought it was just like a family fight, and when they looked outside, they didn't see anybody leaving the house. At around 11 p.m. on the night of the murders, Jimmy Pride, Valerie's ex-husband, and the father of her girls arrived at her home. And when he was informed about the murders of his daughters, Jimmy became hysterical, as you can imagine. Police ended up having to restrain Jimmy until he calmed down. Detectives spoke to several of Valerie's neighbors, but most of them had not heard anything, and the ones that did hear something had not seen anything. With robbery ruled out, detectives were having a hard time developing a motive for these murders. It was hard enough to imagine someone doing this to Valerie, let alone her two innocent children. As the investigation unfolded, the detectives dove deeper into this tragic case, piecing together crucial details that shed light on the sequence of events leading to Valerie and her daughter's murder. Among their discoveries, the investigators found out about Valerie's final phone call, and it was a clue that significantly contributed to figuring out the timeline of the murders. According to the investigators, it appeared that Valerie had been ambushed shortly after opening the door setting off the chain of horrifying events. The investigators theorized that in a desperate bid to protect herself, Valerie might have instinctively rushed towards the kitchen to find a weapon to defend herself. Tragically, she was the first victim. After that, both of her daughters were brutally stabbed. A critical piece of evidence confirming the investigator's theory of how the killer got away was a bloody handprint that was discovered on the fence behind the family's home. This pointed to the exact route taken by the perpetrator, who had managed to get away by scaling the fence before running through the yard of an abandoned home nearby. But complicating the investigation further was the fact that the family had only recently moved into the neighborhood just a few weeks before the murder. The fact that most people in the neighborhood did not know the young family heightened the challenge for law enforcement. In their effort to find answers, the police began to redirect their focus towards understanding Valerie's life, her social circles, family connections, and the potential existence of any enemies. But Despite exhaustive searches into Valerie's background, friends, and her family, the investigators found nothing out of the ordinary. Valerie's life appeared very normal. She had no conflicts with anyone or disputes that could offer a motive for such a heinous crime. 
The detectives were baffled, and without any leads pointing to a plausible motive, the investigators found themselves grappling with the unknown surrounding the inexplicable and senseless murders of Valerie and her children. When the autopsy was performed, it was confirmed that all three victims had sustained multiple stab wounds. However, they had not been sexually assaulted, and so that was also ruled out as a possible motive. Funerals for Valerie and her daughters were held on September 10th, 1982. The devastating murders had rocked the community where they lived and left their family and friends completely devastated. And with the killer still on the loose, people were also fearful that there was a killer walking around free. And as the days went by, detectives were unable to narrow down the motive or any suspects. During the investigation, detectives had learned that in August 1982, about a month before the murders, there had been a break-in at Valerie and Ben's home. And during the break-in, it's not clear if anything was taken, but whoever had done it had slashed the waterbed in the couple's room and then took Valerie's clothing and placed them in the water. The strange incident made investigators wonder if there had been a connection between the break-in and the murders. Slashing a waterbed and putting someone's clothing in it is personal. It did seem like someone was mad at Valerie about something, but even after following up on the break-in, detectives were unable to find any additional evidence about whoever had done it. As the months passed, what seemed like promising leads in this case began to dwindle, leaving detectives dealing with a growing sense of frustration. Despite receiving hundreds of tips from the public, none had managed to help the investigators get any closer to identifying a viable suspect or unraveling the mystery behind the brutal murders of Valerie and her daughters. As the case became cold, a familiar pattern emerged as rumors started to circulate around the unsolved case. This is common in the aftermath of unsolved murders, and Valerie's case was no exception. Among the speculations that surfaced, the one that began to gain traction was the suggestion that the death of Ben's daughter might somehow be linked to the triple homicide. Now, some individuals the detectives interviewed insinuated that Valerie and her daughters may have fallen victim to a vengeful act, possibly in retaliation for the tragic loss of Ben's nine-year-old daughter. However, an autopsy conducted in the aftermath of the young girl's death had conclusively determined that her death was consistent with an epileptic seizure, ultimately resulting in an accidental drowning. After receiving the autopsy report, the investigators had no evidence to suggest that the unfortunate and unintentional death of this child had anything to do with these murders, or that it would be motive enough to drive someone to commit such a brutal and heinous murder. But despite the rumors circulating within the community, the detectives continued in their efforts to separate fact from fiction. It was a difficult job trying to navigate through the intricate web of speculation surrounding this case. As the one-year anniversary of the murders approached, detectives working the case found themselves no closer to finding the killer or killers than they were when they first began. A reward of $2,000 was being offered by the union Valerie worked for and the Silent Witness Program, but there had still been no new or significant leads coming in about this case. However, in August 1983, investigators announced that they had arrested someone in connection with the murders. A 14-year-old high school student had been taken into custody. Now, when the 14-year-old was arrested, detectives said that they were also searching for another juvenile and an adult who they believed were involved in the murder of Valerie and her daughters. The Arizona Republic newspaper reported that police said that they believed the killing was an act of revenge for the death of Ben's daughter. The 14-year-old that was arrested was apparently a relative of the little girl. Now, despite having gotten the autopsy about the girl's death and their initial doubts, they now believe that these murders may have been some kind of revenge against Ben for the death of his daughter. 
But their theory still did not make much sense. And it's not clear what evidence investigators received that led them to this conclusion. But it was the first time since the murders that police had found anything significant in this case. However, just 24 hours after the arrest, the 14-year-old was let go. The district attorney had declined to file charges and said that more investigation was needed by the Phoenix Police Department and her office. The other two potential suspects were never arrested and no charges were ever filed against the 14-year-old. It's not clear who those two other people were, but after what seemed like a break in the case, once again, it went cold. Two years after the murders, police got a new lead. A neighbor had found a knife in a backyard. When police collected the knife, it was similar in size to the one believed to have killed Valerie and her daughters. The knife was sent to a crime lab for analysis, but they were unable to find any DNA evidence from Valerie, Shantia, or Duena. As the years turned to decades, detectives continued to pursue what little leads they had in this case. Investigators said that they spoke to over a thousand people, but still had been unable to narrow down their killer or their motive. They believed, however, that someone who knew Valerie and her girls knows something about what happened. In 2012, detectives working the case said that they had done all they could in terms of leads and needed the public's help. Their theory was that these murders were personal. Whoever had done this had come to their home that night with one intention, and that was to murder Valerie, Shantia, and Duena. The question of why is still a big part of this mystery. It has now been over 40 years since Valerie, Shantia, and Duena were stabbed to death, and their murder continues to be unsolved. Investigators believe that someone close to Valerie knows what happened, and it's hard to understand how someone could do something like this and then just go on with their lives like nothing happened. In recent years, with advanced technology, detectives have begun retesting evidence in this case and have submitted DNA found at the scene into the national database. There will never be a reason that makes sense about why Valerie and her daughters were murdered because this murder was the epitome of senseless. They did not deserve what happened to them, and no matter how much time has gone by, Anyone willing to stab three people to death deserves to be brought to justice. May Valerie, Shantia, and Duena rest in peace. Thank you for listening to this week's episode. Don't forget to follow us on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, TikTok, and Threads. <laughs>